get we'll get started guys because time is of the present uh, it's, we haven't got a lot so let's get going so as laura said my name is darren bailey i work at the ordnance survey and my role at os is to help teachers and trainee teachers use our materials linked to the various curriculums and syllabuses hopefully you can see the front page of my powerpoint so even though we're talking about primary and secondary i am kind of turned this on to a primary example of how to use Digimap for schools, but with some links into secondary as well. Now, I wanted to focus on the key Ofsted findings that came out quite recently around primary geography. So I want to look at how we can help you with these. So this, this will leak into primary and secondary as well, guys. So first of all, the first one was uh, training. So if you guys have made your way tonight to this session, then you found to, at least you found some training. OK, so this will help you build into your geography curriculum. Now, I will say we work with the Geographical Association and the Royal Geographical Society, both are fantastic advocates for geography in this country. They run lots and lots of school CPD sessions covering primary and secondary, key stage one to key stage four. So if you're looking for some training to build on your geography and your geography knowledge, make sure you go and have a look at these guys' websites, okay? They will be able to be able to host some training for you. And of course, keep coming to the fantastic webinars that Adina are running as well and build your knowledge around using Digimap for schools. Now, the second one, important geographical skills were lacking. So I'm going to do a little bit of live demo showing you these the items there where we've got sky, scale, symbols, grid references, UK, Europe, et cetera, et cetera. And the third one, school's not meeting the national curriculum. So again, looking for guidance for you guys to go and find some information about how you can link your geography into the curriculum to make sure you're delivering that rounded curriculum that Ofsted want to see. So the first one I'm going to lead you to is a document that we've created, which is available on the Digimap for Schools website. So this is teaching map skills to inspire a sense of place and adventure. Now this is pitched at key stage one and two. This has been created by Paula Owens and Paula Owens is a leading name in geography in this country. She creates lots of fantastic resources and is a superb geographer. Now she's created this fantastic guidance for us, bringing together all the elements that you'll need to, to meld in your primary ge geography curriculum. So this is looking at planning, this is looking at um, progression throughout year one to year six and all the links into the Ofsted guidance as well. So the front page looks like this one. And there's just a little, uh, little piece I've taken out of the uh, booklet here, looking at those knowledgeable elements across the geography curriculum and looking at that kind of progression guidance there as well. Now, for early years, and if a few secondary guys out there are listening, we are hoping to have new versions of this created for early years and for secondary for September. So there will be a family of documents linked into that progression curriculum and Ofsted guidance covering from early years through to the end of Key Stage 4. So have a look at the Digimap for Schools website and look at ours as well. And those, hopefully those resources will be there for the start of the new academic year. Finally, number five, because number two and number four, I'm going to show the live examples. So number five, so very few primaries work with secondary schools. So this is one of those key findings that Ofsted found. I've always found this a very interesting one, not coming from a teaching background myself. Why don't the primary schools and the secondary schools speak to each other? Because this is going to be so relevant for you secondary guys on the geography that you can do with your pupils at year seven and year eight based on their experience and knowledge of their primary school geography. So why aren't you guys working together? So what can we do? What can we do to help you with this in the, in the basis of using Digimap for schools? Is there a possibility that we can run some joint training sessions where we can get the secondary school along and bring all the feeder primary school geography uh, leads as well together and maybe do something based around that? So we'll be interested to see what you secondary guys think of that. And of course, your primary guys, if you think working with the secondary guys will, would also be useful in any way, we can help you with that as well. So I'm going to stop sharing my uh, PowerPoint now there will be this will be made available so you can come and get this and download it for another point if you would like could you pop a marker on the audit survey HQ for me So guys, what I was trying to put across that you couldn't see, sadly, was that concept of scale. So using different scales to look at place and location. So using a large scale map to originally find the building you're looking for. And then you can just keep zooming out for me, Viv. 
So then we can see the different scales. We see it 1 to 25K. If we zoom out again, we can see 1 to 50K. So we're starting to see that larger area and seeing how things are di depicted differently on an ordnance survey map. And then as you can see, we can come right out. We start to see county information. Then we'll see in the southern coast of England and all the way out until we see the context of the whole of UK. So using those different scales to look at place and location. So seeing where you fit in your local, re regional, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So those. So Viv, can you zoom out to the extent of the UK? And in the overlays, can you overlay the British national grid system, please? I think you might have to zoom in one layer. There you go. So guys, one of those key skills is using the national grid system to use for your four and six figure coordinates. So there's a couple of really nice tools within Digimap for Schools to help you with these. So we can see the full extent of the UK here, okay, with the complete overlay on top of the map. Viv, if you can zoom in on the Ordnance Survey HQ again on the postcode. So as you go down through the grid, we start to see that division of grid. And of course, you guys know that knowing which 100 kilometer grid square you're in is incredibly important when you're doing your grid reference work. So we can zoom right in and keep going in Viv until we're right in on, the, on top of the OS building. So using this to do our coordinates and our grid work, okay, with your pupils. Now you can, of course, print these maps out if you want to stop there, Viv, that's fine. So you can print these maps out and use these and have physical, tangible copies in the classroom to be able to use. But as you can see, if you could just pan up just a fraction, Viv, just so we can see all the coordinates, fantastic. So we can see now our completed grid for six-figure grid references. So we can do this the proper way. So we can go along the corridor and up the stairs to find our points and our coordinates for our six-figure grid reference. And of course, more importantly, you can see the abbreviation SU which is very important when we're actually doing our grid reference work to show this. Now, Viv, you can just show the grid reference tool as well that's under the drawing tools. So we also have the option, if you click on anywhere on a point on the map, it will also give you the grid reference. So we can find the grid reference for specific locations. So if you're doing a nice little study around your locality, around landmarks in your location, can we find these landmarks? Can you give me the grid references for these locations? Or you can build these into kind of quizzes. So can we find historical buildings throughout the UK and find the grid references for those locations? And do it when completing your grid reference skills that way. So it's a really nice way to introduce those grid reference skills, those key mapping skills. So, Viv, can you zoom out to the extent of the world for me, please? So the, 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 the great thing about Digimap Skills now is not only are we limited to Great Britain, we can now go anywhere in the world to show a map. So when you're linking your European and world geography, we now have those options to be able to do this. So, Viv, if you can turn on the overlays, could you please turn on the major lines of latitude? So here we're about to show you those elements that you'll find in the Key Stage 2 curriculum, the, the wording that you'll find. So we've got the tropics, the equator, the Arctic Circle, et cetera. So that terminology we'll use in the classroom, you can look at this. Uh, Viv, can you change the map to the Atlas view? So we've got two ways of doing this. We've got a beautiful physical view, but we also have our Atlas view. So why not use Digimap for Schools as an Atlas? to look for places and locations in the world. So you've got that fantastic online atlas you can use with your pupils. Can you put on the world time zones, please, quiz, uh, Viv? So world time zones, again, some terminology, geographical skills, looking at time and locations, time zones specifically mentioned in the curriculum. We can bring in the terminology of hemispheres by leaving the equator on there. So looking at Southern and Northern hemisphere. And this is an opportunity as well to link in some maths. So looking at different places, different times and different worlds. So linking a little bit of maths into your geography, looking at those time differences. So these are some really, really fantastic overlays that we can show for the world for those key geographical skills. Viv, you could just zoom back in on the OSHQ using the postcode.
And finally, on the map selector box there, guys, we've got Aerial and Aerial X. So, Viv, if you could turn one of those on for me, that would be great. So, one of those key things for recognizing place and location at key stage one is using Aerial Imagery to interpret place. So here again is a tool that you can use to bring in that element at key stage one, looking at place and location using aerial imagery. And if you could, if you could put on the OS map and slide between the two, Viv. So we can now slide between the aerial image and the map. So to help us understand and interpret the map, we can use the aerial image and the mapping layer together. So looking at those key geographical skills as well. Now, Viv, you might need to give me back control because fortunately I planned ahead and put my uh, fieldwork elements into my into my PowerPoint so people could at least see those. So I won't be able to show them live on Digimap Schools, but at least I'll be able to talk you through them hopefully on my PowerPoint. So this is looking at fieldwork elements. So one of those things that came up was looking at opportunities for fieldwork. Now, these can link in to both primary and secondary. So I'm going to show you a couple of these on the screen. So the first one you're going to see is a land use map. So this is a really nice piece of geography to do with Key Stage 2 pupils, but also for you Key Stage 3 people looking at land use at a location, this is a great little piece of work to do. OK, because this can be around your own locality. Um, it's about collecting and presenting data, which is terminology you'll find in Key Stage 3, and using GIS to show this. Using symbols, so there's a conversation to be have, how would you symbolize place and location? So you can see on this map, looking at the buildings, classifications for the buildings that the pupils used. So this one's, this one's called, what's this? Okay, so for primary pupils, okay, using your own school grounds to do field work. So how about taking obscure pictures of certain things in your school grounds and linking them to your map? So then your pupils go and explore and see if they can find out what these images are in their location or in around the school, school field. So using your own school grounds to do your field work, which is a nice way to link those in. And of course, using photos to recognize place and location in the school grounds. So let's stop sharing, show you my next map. See if this one works. So hopefully you can see one now that says symbol walk. That looks like the same one as previously, Darren. Uh, OK, well, this is going really well. I can see your slides down the side. It's look, almost yeah. as a, that's that looks more like a symbol walk. There you go. Yeah, that's a symbol walk. OK, so symbol walk again. This can be key stage two or it can be key stage three. So if you've got key stage three people that don't know they're all at survey symbols, haven't looked at place and location, this is a nice one to link in, but it's especially useful key stage two um, using all survey symbols where those are introduced. So this is planning a walk around a locality, identifying ordnance survey symbols in your location. Okay, so planning a walk to go past as many of these as you possibly can, and on that walk, collecting images. So what do these symbols look like in the real world? So to collecting images of a lake, of a, of a main road, of some coniferous trees, of a church, et cetera, et cetera. So using those in your location, okay? So a really nice way to be able to link those elements together, looking at planning a, planning a walk, or using symbols and using images and bringing them together there. So, and the f let's see if this one works. OK, so hopefully you can see my decibel map. So this one's a really good one again for key stage three and key stage two. Can't so this is but well, this is collecting data in your location. So this would be a map showing you decibel levels. So looking at the sound around a particular location and geo referencing those particular points on a map. So using your map to observe, observe, measure and record information on a map terminology that you'll find in the curriculums so this is a human one looking at the human noise in a location so the sound of traffic etc etc those kind of things so there's there or you could do this around things like temperature in the school grounds rainfall in a location can we record certain points around a location and observe measure and record that on a on a map and the final one i was going to show you guys was especially for key stage four um, 
which is this one on the side here, which you're easily going to be able to see. Okay, so this is a field trip by a key stage four group of pupils to a particular beach location, recording sand heights at groins. So again, using GIS to collect, analyze, and draw conclusions from geo data. So this was collecting those sand heights at groins and trying to make a link between offshore drift, oh, sorry, longshore drift and the accumulation of sand around groins and mapping these to show a location. So this is one of those maps. So guys, obviously my presentation is not working fantastic, so I'm going to stop there. So is there any questions you need me to answer in the chat, Emma? Uh, no, I can't see any at the moment, uh, okay. Darren, but if anybody would like to ask the questions now, then we've yeah. got a couple of seconds. Worth guys, the, sh the, the PowerPoint has been shared with Laura, so she will make that a fa available when it, uh, as soon as we can get it pa posted up onto the website, guys. There's a couple of questions have come in, Darren. <clears throat> um, how do you drop photos onto the map? Okay. okay, so there is a little photo icon under drawing tools, which says image. And with that tool, you can click on that image tool, click anywhere on your map to geo, geo um, locate that particular image. And then you can just upload an image from the hard drive or the network of your on your school. And you can link that directly to your map. So this can be pre pre collected images that you've got or images your pupils have collected for their location and link them to the map very easily. Thank you, Darren. We'll send um, a help page, a little link to show people how to do that as well. Yeah. Somebody's asked about how do you view the aerial imagery. So on the actual map, there is a button that says map selector. And on the map selector, you've got different views that you can use. And one of them is aerial. Well, there's aerial X, aerial X just adds place names and road names. So it's quite easy to be able to move between those different data sets. And someone's asked about an introductory video. So again, we'll send a, a link to that. So guys, that, that's me. Sadly, it didn't work perfect. Okay, I've already shown you some really, really good maps. But we, as I said, the PowerPoint will be made available so you'll be able to view those maps that we've put together. So I will hand over to Emma if there's no more questions. Thanks, Darren. Thanks very much, Darren. Um, hopefully everybody can see my screen. Yes, that looks right. fine, Emma. Okay, and so I'm going to share the full screen and hopefully we won't get any technical issues. Um, so just collapse all of that. Okay then, so I'm going to showcase um, some use of Digimap for, for schools that I've done quite recently in the classroom. I've used it lots outside the classroom, but this one uh, relates to inside the classroom. And... So I thought I'd provide a little bit of a background. So um, the Geographical Association Initiatives Fund um, provided us with some funding. And um, it was for Adriana Morellis and myself um, to take uh, 248 Upper Key Stage 2 pupils, and there were 20 teachers and teaching assistants from five schools across um, Gloucestershire, South Gloucestershire, the Bristol area, on a scintillating South American adventure. Um, in October 2020, right in the middle of uh, the pandemic. Now, it was originally intended to hold um, this particular um, multi-schools event um, in the Department of Geography and Education uh, and Environmental Management at the University of the West of England, UWE, which is on the outskirts of Bristol. However, we had COVID-19 and quite a few implications, and so we had to be a little bit creative and contemplated um, doing this via Zoom. So you can see a blog post report from that first event in, on uh, the 15th of October, 2020. And I was then asked if I would write an article for the uh, Geographical Association's Primary Geography Journal. And so this is in the summer edition and uh, um, it's got a link to um, what we did and some uh, web, uh, resources and things that you might find useful too. But the feedback that we had from pupils, you can see some of it there. I know lots more about the Amazon now, we need to do more to help. I enjoyed having a Zoom session with other schools so we could learn together. I like the opportunity to learn from someone who has had experience of it, not just my teacher. Adriana is a Brazilian and she's had first-hand experience of the Amazon. Um, and it was really fun to learn about uh, South America and the people and the children who live there. And we had some great uh, feedback from the teachers as well. 
So uh, things like what a fantastic learning experience for staff and students at our school. The pupils were fully engaged and were able to use such a wide range of skills throughout the day from problem solving to analysing to thinking creatively. The day was a great way of enriching our geography curriculum and bringing core key stage two geographical knowledge and, and skills and understanding to life. A really valuable experience that the children learned a lot from. And so it continues. So following all this positive feedback, Adriana and I thought, actually, we don't need to stop here. We need to take this a little bit further. So I thought I'd just share this with you. Okay, so um, I hope some of you, I know there were some bits coming up in the chat box that a couple of people couldn't see the video, um, but I hope a majority of you were able to see some of that. Um, so I just thought I'd put a sort of uh, a, a talk about a typical uh, multi-school event. So you can see there, uh, we start at nine o'clock in the morning, we have a, a welcome and a starter for the first half hour. And then the uh, second um, uh, sort of part of the day um, is session one, which is all about geography and critical thinking and literacy. Uh, we focus on locational and place knowledge, uh, human and physical geography and geographical skills, which we continue with after break. 
And after lunch, we have a second session where we uh, focus on some art and D&T and we go right into the heart of the Amazon rainforest before um, a half an hour plenary session towards the end. Um, and what I did uh, when we were sort of constructing this particular workshop was to integrate some activities from the GA's Critical Thinking and Practice Guide and the British Council's uh, training days. I do the critical thinking and problem solving for them. So I tried to integrate some activities um, into the day. Um, so I thought I'd just uh, uh, chat through some of the screens here, okay, very quickly. Um, so our starter. Now our starter um, is where we outline the learning uh, objectives that uh, are very closely linked to the national curriculum, uh, Key Stage 2 Programme of Study for Geography. And we look at the development of critical thinking skills and we um, give out a sort of format of the day. Um, scores allocated names based on groups that have an interest in the, the Amazon region. So that could be loggers, miners, conservationists, researchers, etc. And then I access Google Earth Pro and I take pupils and teach on a virtual trip. So I go from Bristol, which is my nearest city, to Manaus in Amazonas uh, in um, northern Brazil. And I question pupils. I sort of ask them the, the distance that they think is involved, how long it might take, sort of means of transport and the cost. And that is where they um, access Digimap for Schools to, to help them. And then I show them a movie clip, which takes them deep into the heart of um, the Amazon. So they get a feeling of what it is really like. We then see that we move on to activity one. Now, activity one is where we look at the distribution of the tropical rainforest. And pupils can work either independently or in pairs, depending on uh, what is deemed most appropriate in their um, setting. Um, and they can access Google Earth Pro or they can access an online atlas like Digimap for Schools. Uh, they can use a hard copy of an atlas. They can use a globe. But they've got to answer the question on which uh, continents and in which countries countries are tropical rainforests found and Digimap for Schools is great for this because it's got an overlay where you can put it in the biomes okay of the world but they're expected to write their answers around the outside of the map that they're given and then we uh, prompt them to perhaps zoom in on South America and onto Brazil and onto the Amazon basin so that they get a bird's eye view of an extensive uh, um, area of tropical rainforest and again Digimap for Schools has got that aerial uh, facility that Darren was showing earlier. And afterwards, I call upon the different schools to provide me with some, um, some answers. So you can see the children um, in action um, there. Um, and then we move on. We look at a climate graph for, uh, and data for Manaus um, in uh, a city that's located on the River Amazon um, in the state of Amazonas in northern Brazil. And again, pupils can work in pairs or independently, whatever is deemed uh, most appropriate. And they use the sources uh, provided to help identify or calculate answers to a number of questions on uh, a sheet. Um, so they might be identifying the months with the highest or the lowest temperature or precipitation. They might be calculating the range in temperature or uh, annual uh, precipitation. Precipitation. And then what we do is we reconvene um, to share um, our findings. Um, our next activity, activity three, is all about the tropical rainforest biome. And you can see there that pupils are given a, a short uh, piece of text and they're expected to find uh, a word from the table below to fill the gap. So this is really reinforcing um, subject specific vocabulary there. I reveal the answers and at the end I ask them what have they um, learnt about the, the tropical uh, rainforest biome. Uh, we then move on and we look at the five W's and how approach. I give them a little bit of background information, first of all, about the why the tropical rainforests are important. And I give them a few facts and statistics which uh, about its status as a pharmaceutical uh, wonderland, obviously um, pretty um, important at this moment in time. And we explore deforestation uh, within the tropical rainforest. I show them a couple of movie clips. Um, and then we look at this image with the five W's and how approach. And I ask them um, to uh, feedback some answers to the questions there. Um, and uh, we, we sort of outline some of the action that's been taken, but we really do appreciate that perhaps more needs to be done. We then move on to activity five, which is a thunk. 
Okay, and uh, before we do that, they are given um, uh, um, uh, some images um, uh, of the tropical rainforest, three images in actual fact, and they've got to select a suitable caption to go alongside each one. And then we get them to consider uh, two options. So option one there, you can see, let the indigenous people live and manage the land as they have for thousands of years, or should the land be cleared for the cattle ranching? And we get whole class discussions being held in each classroom, steered by the teacher. Um, and then we get them to think about this thunk where they've got to think uh, deeply and philosophically and independently about what their dream Amazon would be like. And I emphasize that they cannot be right or they cannot be uh, wrong. OK, there's no sort of right or wrong answer. But we get them to uh, jot down a few words to start off with. And then we try to get them to expand each of those words to form a series of bullet points or a paragraph of writing. And then they share those bullet points, their paragraph of writing with one or two of their peers. And they sort of ponder whether their dreams for the Amazon are very similar or if they're very different. And then um, we ask uh, teachers to select three uh, pupils from each school to share their dreams with us. And you can see how they're sharing their dreams with a much, much wider audience. Some of the schools have actually taken this um, uh, further the next day and created some absolutely wonderful um, writing, OK, that uh, goes on um, from there. And you can see um, how it links in with literacy. Um, activity um, then six, I hand over to Adriana. And Adriana, um, she has first-hand experience of the, the Amazon. And so we learn about the Indigenous people's culture and their lifestyle through the medium of art and d and And so we emphasise the extent and diversity uh, within Brazil. And uh, we link back to Digimap for schools as well, so we can compare the size um, of the UK um, with um, Brazil how many UKs will fit into Brazil perhaps. Um, and then she shows a series of photographs and movie clips and she takes them uh, into the heart of the Amazon, talks about the rivers being roads and um, you know, some of the issues that the Amazon uh, people uh, face and how this actually might re relate to us. And um, we, we learn that the indigenous people, they live in the forest and they work with nature, they protect it, they live in harmony, they have this simple life they live in. Uh, communities, they maintain strong uh, traditions, and they live extensive distances from each other. So again, we can use Digimap to uh, perhaps uh, emphasize some of those, uh, those distances involved, but traditions encourage them to meet up and to have fun and to help each other. So this Indigenous people's philosophy of all about sustainability uh, of the rainforest, living within its limits, relating to it in an affectionate way, dreaming about the forest and this belief in um, uh, forest spirits. And so um, Adriana, she showcases some of the items that she's collected on her trip to the Amazon and she demonstrates how they can be used to create a forest spirit. And she also adds some um, animation to it so that her forest spirit has um, character. And then we give the children time to be creative. So they've previously gathered some natural artifacts and they produce their own forest spirit. And then we share those uh, images that the teachers have taken uh, of their artwork with Brazilian teachers uh, and pupils. And we challenge pupils to think about what the children in Brazil have perhaps taught them and uh, what they might be able to do to support the children in Brazil. And uh, you can see them getting involved in some of their artwork that they've created. And uh, we're very fortunate now to have strong links with the Cambibas, the Cambiba indigenous community, um, about an hour and a half from Manaus. Um, Adriana is in regular contact with them probably once a week. She's uh, taught them some art and animation. And, uh, you know, we're sharing uh, their classroom and their artwork um, with uh, children over here. And what's been really nice is 5% of the proceeds, because um, it's very much a non-profit making exercise, but 5% of any uh, proceeds then um, are um, uh, gifted to the community. And this has allowed them to pay for COVID-19 treatment for Tatika, who's the medicinal woman uh, within the wider community there. And they've just recently bought a sewing machine and they're now uh, making their own clothes, which is lovely. So you can see there some of the feedback um, from um, pupils that have been involved in the day. And then we finish off with a plenary where we sort of reflect and we share learning experiences 
um, and uh, I ask them to sum up the day in five words or a sentence or two and we think about sort of three key questions there before we review the learning outcomes with a thumbs up thumbs down. Um, if you want to read more about a typical day this was our last one okay so uh, in, in mid-May um, and our next one is next Wednesday. We have got a couple of places remaining. So if you are interested, then do get in touch. And my email is uh, at the bottom there. OK, thank you. Uh, sorry, I wasn't able to monitor the chat feed at the same time as presenting. But um, if there's any questions there. I don't think there's any. As anything that's come up. I don't think there's any specific questions, Emma. Thank you so much. That was really fascinating to see that. I love the such a wide range of activities that the kids got involved in. Um, someone did ask who facilitates this sort of event. So maybe you could say a little bit about the sort of practical setting up and organising of it. You know, do you have lots of pre-meets with the teachers to... Yes, we do. Yes. So uh, prior to any event, um, a couple of days before or up to a week before, um, I have all the staff from all the schools involved. We usually have about uh, six schools involved on each event and all staff will have um, a half hour just preliminary meeting where I will share a resource list with them. Um, and um, I will talk through the structure of the day, just like I have done now. Um, I will answer any questions that they've got. But basically, the whole idea is that Adriana and I um, steer the event so that the, the teachers are able to, to actually learn alongside the children and just have a, a great day. All the things that you need are things that you've got in the classroom already beyond the natural artefacts that the children have to collect uh, a couple of days before. Wonderful. Um... Yeah, so then are you and Adriana, you know, on screen on a whiteboard, you know? Yeah, we're on screen by Zoom and we steer it all through Zoom. Uh, we ask for um, webcams uh, to be displayed in each classroom and for the classrooms to have a microphone so that the children can come up to the, the front screen. They can share their work with us, share it with the wider audience as well, engage with us fully. We have a chat feed uh, running through too and uh, teachers are able to unmute themselves. Children are able to uh, come up to the front and to talk as well. So it's very, very interactive. Yeah, sounds sounds great. And um, yeah, em, both Emma Diffley and I have posted a couple of links to um, some resources, um, Digimap for Schools resources, that is. And I just thought maybe it'd be helpful since you authored those locational knowledge resources for us. Maybe if you could say a little about why you think Digimap for Schools is useful for the locational knowledge area of the uh, Yes, is a... Um, there's a, a bank, a library of teaching resources on Digimap for Schools. So if you go to Learning Resources and it will come up and there's a whole um, section on primary. Uh, but there's uh, about 12 resources that Professor um, Simon Catling and myself produced um, last summer. Uh, all about locational knowledge, which tie in very closely with the National Curriculum Programme of Study for um, England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Um, and they are aimed at Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. Um, and they target very much uh, a lot based on the geographical skills um, sections of all of those programmes of study. Super. Um, someone's asking where we can find those. I've, I've already put the link in the chat, but we, we'll send that out in a follow up email too. Um, someone's saying how much does it cost? I'm not sure if they mean the Digimap for School service or um, one of Emma's events. Yeah, I'll just put a link in here to um, the um, our next event on there. It is on the last slide, but it's on there too, which has got all the details. Um, it's £250 for, per school to take part for the whole day, and you can have as many students as you can facilitate your end. Um, it is aimed at Upper Key Stage uh, 2 pupils. Um, however, we have had some Year 4 um, involved as well, which has worked uh, uh, successfully. Uh, they may just need a little bit more input at uh, your end. Um, year 5 and 6 can be a little bit more independent, so they might require a little bit of supervision um, in situ. Um, but yeah, um, that's uh, for as many pupils as you can involve. So we've had some schools who have had Year 5 and Year 6 involved, uh, 180 pupils in some instances, you know, so yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emma. And um, yeah, I suppose I just thought I noted down a few of the ways in which you use Digimap for Schools in your um, events. So you use the biomes overlay, it's got the, the WWF biomes we have, um, and also the measuring. It sounded like they did a fair bit of measuring distances between 
countries and locations. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you again um, to Emma and Darren. Really useful ideas. I hope that's going to be very useful for all you guys. Uh, now I'm going to hand over to Emma Diffley from the Digimap for Schools team, who's going to do a, a quick overview of what we've been up to in the service and some future plans. And so again, we'll do a little Q&A after Emma Diffley's presentation. So please do keep questions coming in the chat. Lovely, thanks, Bev. Let me see if I can share my screen successfully. I'm hoping you will be able to see a big green slide with recent developments, future plans on it. If yes. I, I'm assuming you can see it. If you can't, please put it in the chat. Um, thanks, Viv. Um, very quick run through about how um, many updates and things we've given, we've, we've done to Digimap for Schools over the last year or so. Um, services are always uh, evolving and um, we have to keep up with new changing technology as well as, um, as what uh, our schools need and so on. Um, let me hope I can get this next slide going. Oh, there we go. Can you everybody see the next slide? Is that working? I'll assume it is, unless I hear otherwise. Um, we've added a couple of extra overlays. Uh, Emma referenced the world biomes in her, her, her talk a minute ago. Here is the, the world biomes layer. I've just put a quick picture in it and you can see where to, to get to it. If you go to the, um, the overlays tab, which is in the far left hand panel and there's a little um, orange and yellow layers symbol. If you open that, you can see all the different overlays that are available. The world biomes are, the, are, are new ones. We've also added world time zones, which is also very interesting. When they, they are straight when you go across the sea, but then of course they follow uh, national boundaries when you go across the land. Um, we've recently, very recently actually, revamped our website. We hope that it's easier to find things on it. It has a better look and feel to it. Key points there are that the learning resources are now are much better organized and you should be able to find out um, much uh, much fun, much more easily than the things that you, you want. Um, as we've pointed out today, there are a few things there that, that we've highlighted that you might be interested in. Um, we also redesigned all our drawing tools. Um, this came as a result of a changing underlying technology, but also some feedback from, from our user community saying that some things were a bit tricky to find and fit to use. So what we've done is to um, change the way it works slightly to make it easier to add multiple copies of a particular features. If you want to add 20 markers for 20 different locations, you can do them one after the other rather than have to go back to the tool and backwards and forwards. It's much easier to set the fill and line colours, so change the symbol that you want, or change the colour of a symbol, same, change the size of font and so on. It's also easier to move individual features around. Um, definitely worth having a play with these. Um, Viv mentioned earlier that our YouTube channel has lots of little videos on it. Do have a look at those because we've taken uh, individual uh, items within Digimap and created uh, YouTube videos about each section. So there's none of them are many, many more than a, a minute, a minute and a half, two minutes long, but they'll give you a much better idea of how to use individual features within the service. We also increase the uh, types of data, the number of types of different data you can add from your own sources. So anybody with a, 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 a GPS watch of some sort can now um, download the tracks from that, the GPX tracks, and upload those into Digimap. So if you were to take your class on a walk, somebody with a an Apple Watch or similar, um, I think the BBC say other uh, varieties are available, uh, you can then take the, the track that your device records and then upload it onto the map to see exactly where you've, where you've walked. You can also add point data as before, which is a simple CSV file using Excel and there are instructions and videos on the YouTube channel on how to, how to do that. Um, we've run a reasonably successful series of webinars over the last year or so. We will continue to do this, of course, um, we get some great feedback. It's lovely that you have the time to, to join us for, for these things. If there are particular topics um, that anybody feels they need covered, then we're always willing to listen to ideas. Um, the webinars are all listed on our website and you can register for the webinars on that page as well. As Viv said previously, all our previous webinars are on our YouTube channel and you can go back and watch those again. Um, also on our YouTube channel, which um, kicked off of course about March last year, are some home activity ideas. So while we none of us relish the prospect of um, classes isolating. We have to accept that for the moment it is a, it is a reality. If you are setting work for um, children to do at home, then there are some home activity ideas that you might find uh, useful and interesting. Um, oh, there we go. I've already talked about the how-to videos. These are small snippet type videos centered on individual features, which are useful for just learning how to use individual um, functions within the service. We recently introduced a free trial uh, for Digimap. So you appear, to, if you want to take advantage of the free trial, you appear to go through a 
purchasing process, but in fact, the thing you purchase is free. Um, this is our, a picture of our subscription portal. And on it, you can see there's a free trial version at the bottom. If you add that to your basket and it, you follow the process through to submit your contact details, it doesn't cost you anything. We don't issue an invoice, um, but you can then have a, a month worth of free trial. There's more information about that on our website, of course. Future plans where we have ideas to add some more overlays, for example, the hill shading is one that we're working on. So you could have a look at an area and get an idea of the slope and aspect and where the shadows fall and so on. We're also looking to create more data sets that are too complicated for us to add as overlays, but would be useful over much smaller areas. So things like um, county boundaries, ward boundaries, th things like that. And of course, we will continue our schedule of, of webinars um, ongoing. I think that's all I have for now, but I'm very happy to answer any questions at the moment. Uh, Viv has put our poll up. If you wouldn't mind completing that, that would be really helpful. It helps us to uh, know where to go next to, to help you do what you need to do. Thanks, Emma. There's no um, additional questions, so um, hopefully we will get some good responses to the poll. Um, I think I'm not sure if Laura put the request in. Um, if you do have anything to add to your poll response, that would be excellent to hear about that in the chat. Um, you know, this is just a, an opportunity to give us a bit of feedback, um, which we would review and um, base some, some future plans around that. Also worth oh, adding, Viv, that yeah, as ever, if anybody has any questions anytime, do email us. We are here to offer support and answer questions. So please don't hesitate to get in touch if you do have questions. Um, I. One of our team suggested earlier that perhaps it would be an idea to share the Digimap for Schools screen again. Um, sorry, Andrew, yes. Um, if you do have anything additional to add about what would be useful for you for Digimap for Schools, improve your experience, please let us know in the chat here. Yeah, just keep the comments coming. Um, if it's useful, I think we have five minutes left. I could do a quick sort of, another little quick demo of some of the things that Emma Espley and Darren mentioned. Or perhaps it's better to let people go and send them, send you guys some videos and help pages afterwards. Um, there's no contour line, um, there's no specific contour line overlay um, at present. It's a matter of whether they're available on particular maps. Correct. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah they're available at certain scales, Viv. So if you see the equivalent of one to 25k map, you should be able to see the um, contour lines on those. Okay, thank you for the feedback on the Eastings and Northings on the print. Someone's asking where to find the scale. Okay, I'm going to quickly share my screen. And um, Emma, if I could ask you to check the chat for anything else that's. Yeah, of course. Coming. Okay, so if I just um, zoom in on London. I'm using a, a touchscreen Chromebook here, which um, it's not my usual method of using Digimap for schools. Okay, but I've zoomed in a few times on London and um, there's an indication of scale at the bottom here. So it says two kilometers. So that gives an indication of uh, scale on screen, but there's this map information um, menu option in the menu on the left here. So this will tell you um, the map that you're viewing. So this is the Ordnance Survey map product. This is the date of publication. And this is the, the default print scale. Um, so that again is an indication of the scale of the map you're viewing on the screen. When you choose to print your map, um, we give you a print scale. So hopefully you can see here, this one's one to 124,000 approximately. Um, but you can choose whether to um, round that up to perhaps something that's a bit more understandable for, for pupils or um, choose that exact exact number. So you can't select the exact scale that you want, um, but you could choose a, a, a sort of rounded scale. I'm not sure if there's any more questions coming in. Um, if there's just... one, there's there's one I can get you to show. Uh -huh. So Andrew said, also can a, a viewed map have a bespoke legend? So if you go to the legend on the left-hand panel underneath the drawing tools, mm -hmm. So this is for anybody watching, guys. What 
whatever scale of map you have on the screen, you have the applicable symbols on the left-hand panel here. So as you go through those different ordnance survey scales, you do have the unique symbols to those scales of maps. I'll just zoom into a different map so you can see that the, you know, the legends change. So this one that I'm viewing now, I think, is this the one to 50,000? Yeah, that's, that's 25K. Yeah, so that's the equivalent of your paper yeah. land explorer. Or? That, explorer that's the explorer map. map. Yeah. So these are the symbols really, which I think schools would be focusing on, aren't they? The ones in the, these one to 25,000 and one to 50,000 maps. Yeah, that's, that's the most common uh, symbols that people would use. So these are all, yes. all it, these different sections of the, the legend here on the left. It's Someone's worth adding that, sorry, but Darren, I was just going to add, it's, it's worth adding that we can't get a, a legend to be any more bespoke than that in, in, <laughs> without getting very, very complicated. It is yes. possible, it's doable. We've done it in our higher education service, but it's very complicated. Yes, <laughs> so yes. you're right that if you're looking at the, the Land Ranger and Explorer maps, the legend that you see on the left-hand side there is is will cover anything that could appear on the map, not necessarily what is actually in the viewing window that you're looking at right at that moment. Yeah. I think it's worth pointing out that when you print a map, um, you can tick add legend at the bottom and that'll give you a PDF file with the legend for that particular map. Um, also in our Learning Resources Centre, we've added um, PDFs of, of all the legends as well. Um, so if you want to print those from there, that's also potentially useful as a resource. I think there's also an OS map symbol flashcard set, um, which is available on the OS, OS education site, of course, but I've also put a link to it on the Digimap for Schools resources. Um, so yes. also, I've, um, in the past, I've printed off maps and um, I've had them uh, uh, put on A3 and laminated them, and I've used them to support local field work activities. So in the chat, I have just put a link to two geography days that I've done with years three to year six. Uh, where I've used Digimap for schools to create uh, maps then um, as part of a sort of orienteering exercise. Super, thank you, Emma. I'm just going to show a couple of other things that people mentioned in the chat. Someone asked where to yeah. see the aerial maps. So this is the map selector button is on the map window. So you just, the simplest thing is to tick the radio button next to whatever you want to see. Yeah, 1950s and so on. And then if you want to fade between them, so I've got, um, let's select OS on the left, 1950s on the right. And then this little bar here is where you can uh, fade between. Someone's asked in the chat, how often the maps get updated? So I'll do the OS bit. Somebody want to do the Adina bit? Yeah. So from the OS's point of view, our maps are updated every single day. So they're constantly being updated, but our remit as, a, as the National Mapping Agency of Britain is every major change has to be on a published map within six months. But a major change would be something like a new road network or new housing estate. Yeah, so we take what, um, what OS do as far as the updates are concerned. Darren, it's probably worth saying that the updates appear in your OS master map level um, database. So that's the very, very large yep. scale detailed stuff and yep. everything else follows on from that. We will update the, the maps once, usually once a year. We have a, a schedule of update, which we can send around later, um, but we try and we can't update them as frequently as OS because we just don't have the resources to do it. It would be um, it would be worse than painting the fourth bridge, I think. <laughs> you are geared up to do it with, with we are not. There's also an, the notion that actually consistency between classes. So if you look on Monday, you quite like it to be the same on Monday as it is on Thursday. So updating things too frequently can often be a bad thing. We do do them and we can send around the schedule. Yeah, there's another one in there Viv, about showing the biome information. Yep. Yeah. So do you want to zoom right out to show the world and turn the biome layer on? Sure. And then use the information button at the top to show the biome information. Yep, so I've ticked so you, this little search yep. button at the top and then I can select any one for some information to come up. And also, if you click on the biome drop down list, you can also get the guides to the WWF information yeah. as well. Yeah. So there's a link there to a user guide. I wondered if it was worthwhile showing people where you add an image. Someone asked about that in the chat. So within the drawing tools on the left here, you just select image uh, and then, you know, choose a file as you would on, on another application. And then, you know, 
Dan mentioned uploading uh, images um, of your school and surroundings for, for kids to go and find. So that's a nice way to build place knowledge. There's also um, a bank of images. There's something called the Geograph Project, and that's a public domain. What's the word I'm looking for? Crowdsourcing project. Crowdsourced. Yeah. yeah, where you can. This is only images of GB. So let's zoom in. Um, but you can search for any kind of term. So, for example, I don't know, river, sheep. And um, there's millions, there's about six million images in this database, and they're all displayed um, within Digimap for Schools on your maps. So it's a really nice way for pupils to build place, knowledge. Um, you know, maybe if they're doing a field trip, they can look up images um, of a location, um, all sorts of uses for that. I think we've got some nice resources where Paula Owens wrote for us about exploring a river and, um, you know, you can view different stages of the river for the physical geography of it. Um, someone's asked as, as well, uh, one that you can do on the screen here, Viv, is can they draw a, cir a, or draw a circle with a, di a certain diameter? So could you use the buffer tool to show that? Mm -hmm. So there's a buffer option to create buffers at any size you like with any measurement. So I'll go for a one mile that. buffer and I'm going to make it orange. And I'll put it uh, there. Has that worked? Yeah. So that's the buffer tool you can have. So that was a point buffer. You could also have a line buffer. Um, let's go for a purple one. So it's just a matter of drawing a line, um, which I'm not doing so well on my touch screen. Sorry, I'll have to <laughs> send a little demo of that um, on, on the desktop. I didn't manage that so well on this touch screen. Oh, no, it did work. Uh, Viv, can I explain a little bit about the aerial data? Because I think that the update for that is rather more complicated and it's probably useful for people to understand. Um, the aerial data is only updated once a year. Um, and we get an update from Get Mapping, who is our data supplier. Um, Get Mapping have a flight schedule, so they fly different areas of the country every year, and we can never guarantee which area of the country is going to be flown in any given year. So they start with the areas that are covered by the oldest data and gradually work their way through um, a, a, an update regime that way. However, they also have factors to do with uh, cloud cover, atmospheric conditions, and air traffic control, which determines what they can fly and when. So we've just got this year's uh, this year's update, which was the 20, summer of 2020 that they've flown. And it's huge because of course this year, or last year rather, they haven't had to contend with air traffic control in quite the same way as they have previously because there have been no other airplanes. So we're hoping when we take a proper look at the 2020 update for the aerial photography, there will be many, many more new, um, new areas covered. Uh, so we're, we're looking forward to that. It's a big update. It's enormous. But um, up updating aerial photography is not quite as straightforward as, as other things, maybe. The um, feature selection tool, uh, feature information tool at the top, which Dara mentioned earlier, can also be used to check the fly date for the aerial photography. Yeah. So I'm not sure if there's anything else that would be useful. Uh, well, Emma mentioned measurement, so I can quickly show how to measure distance. Um, okay, I'm feeling with the touch screen on that. Let me uh, try here. Okay, but yeah, you can create me uh, measurement and distance and area measurements on screen as well. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now, I think, because um, we must be getting to the point where we're over time. Um, I'm not sure if Laura would like to, to sum up a little. Um, yeah, well, thank you. Thank you so much, babe. Uh, what we can do is that we can always um, send a video or the guys. We've got plenty of how-to guides in our YouTube channel, so feel free to uh, have a look, subscribe, and uh, also tick uh, on the bell so you can you can have a little notification whenever we upload a video for instance 
this event too. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you so much to um, our team and our fantastic speakers, Emma Espley, Darren Bailey, Emma Diffley for your uh, participation today. Thank you so much for attending this event and we hope that um, this can provide you a great overview of how you can use Digimap for schools in the classroom and beyond all the applications and um, essentially like uh, what we are working on as well. Um, thank you so much. And we will upload this recording um, soon and we'll send a follow-up email with all the materials as we discuss in the event. Um, yeah, so if you've got any questions that uh, you'd like to pop in the chat, uh, we will follow uh, those up later. But yeah, thank you so much for, for attending today.